my name is Carly McLaughlin. I work at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research at the University of Manchester. I'm trying to find a good place to stand so that I'm not in people's way. Uh, and what I'm going to try and talk about today is different models of behaviour that I think are often implicit in the kinds of things we're doing to, to change behaviours to be more sustainable. Uh, with the idea that you will see, as I'm talking through these models, kind of initiatives that you've maybe liked or not liked, that you've been involved with or other people have done. Uh, and the kind of the reason for that is to try and think about using those models to look at problems from kind of different angles. So hopefully that is uh, what is coming. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to talk through these, these models, um, information deficit, economic rationality, uh, social psychology, and in particular, attitude, behaviour, and context, and then social practices, which is from a sort of sociology kind of angle. Um, okay, so information deficit. People just don't understand or know enough. Uh, and I think this can be quite common from people that are really uh, committed to, to trying to affect change. I know that amongst my colleagues, um, it's, often, it's often expressed that people have kind of misperceptions. And if we could just get them to understand, to know the facts, to know how serious it is, then they would do the right thing. Uh, and by implication, we know what the right thing is to do, and we're going to tell them what the right thing to do is, and then, and then they will do it. Um, okay, so I think there's, there's quite a lot of information deficit work going on out there, um, and we could probably have a discussion about how effective that is, and I'll come back to that a bit later on. Okay, so then it gets a little bit more complicated in economic rationality, that people knowing what to do, knowing the right things, maybe not enough, and we need to make it the right uh, choice economically for them. We need to incentivize them in some way. Um, and this model obviously thinks of people, thinks of behaviors as being about individuals, about decision making. Um, and we need to kind of tweak that decision making to push it in the right direction by taxing bads and incentivizing goods. Um, obviously, you know, it is it's slightly more complex than that. It, we know that there are heuristics and people use rules of thumbs and not, not every decision uh, that you make in the day might involve a kind of high level of um, consideration each, each time and people get into these kind of um, patterns of behaviour. Okay. Um, so then the picture becomes more kind of complex still when we look at social psychology, um, where we've got things like attitudes and values playing into this, this decision making. But again, the individual really is the focus of this kind of work. It's about getting people to make better choices. Um, but actually knowing enough or it being an economically the right thing to do might still not be enough because other values, other emotions might be coming into play. Um, there's often um, kind of a lot of attitude and survey work based on this. So, you know, DEFRA annually do a big survey of people's attitudes to the environment and things like that. And that's in this kind of model. And this can often lead to the discussion of the attitude behaviour gap, which is kind of really frustrating for people that are trying to affect change because people say that they want to do the right thing or be more environmental or lower their impacts, but then they don't actually do it. Um, and so that attitude behaviour gap gets a lot of attention, particularly in research, uh, to, try and, to try and find out why, why there is that gap. And that's where the context comes in, that there are other things going on in people's lives, basically, that make it difficult for them to behave in the way that they might like to. Okay, and then the kind of, I would say like the sort of new kid on the block here is social practices. Um, so this is a much more sociology based um, model and it's interested in what people do rather than what they consume or how they feel or the choices that they make. So by that I mean that it's about the practices of everyday life. It's things like commuting, shopping, eating, laundry, bathing and how we, we do those we all know about, you know, when I say those words, you know what, what I mean by them, what, what's involved in doing laundry, what's involved in doing commuting. And it's in this kind of analysis, it's not about how I feel about that, but actually observing the kind of patterns of everyday life. Um, and these are really, they tend to be regular and routine. They structure daily life. And I use that word um, on purpose because I, I take it to imply that it constrains possibility because there are these ways of behaving that are acceptable and done and repeated by lots of your, um, of your peers. And so to try and examine this uh, social practices um, approach, 
Um, researchers in this area, um, which I wouldn't really particularly call myself a researcher in this area, I'm more of a fan of understanding lots of bits of theory and then seeing how you might use it, whereas some people are very much committed to one stream of this, of this kind of theoretical perspective. So people that are, that are in this kind of field, they talk about skills, meaning and stuff, and they say these practices like commuting or shopping or eating are made up of these, these three areas. So by skills, what do we need to know to be able to do that practice? So things like cooking skills, knowing about how to, um, how to reduce food waste from making dishes from leftovers and things like that. Uh, the meaning that's associated with them. So what's the meaning of gifting food to a neighbour compared to what it might have been uh, 20, 30 years ago? And is that a socially acceptable thing to do, to gift food? Uh, and stuff, the actual physical infrastructure, the things that we use. So um, there it might be, you know, the, the recycling uh, facilities available for food waste. Um, and interventions, according to the social practices people, um, have to be targeted at these areas. So we get a slightly different lens from the individual making decisions. Okay, so why do I think it's worth talking about these, these models? Well, I think it gives us different ways to understand the problem. So it helps us think about whatever your particular area of sustainability, or if you're interested in the, the whole gambit of all of it together, um, it, it helps us think about who are the important actors. Are, are they individuals, institutions? Is it the practice themselves? And we help to, I think it helps to build a, a maybe potentially different conceptions of the problem that we're trying to tackle. Uh, it also, I think, helps us think about incremental versus much more radical change. Are we, trying to, are we trying to tweak in line with existing practices, in line with existing values and attitudes and behaviours, or is it much more fundamental? Do these practices structure daily life and we need to structure daily life in a different way, in a fundamentally different way, where we ask much deeper questions about sustainability and the sustainability of our lifestyles? Um, so I think these different lenses potentially give you avenues to generate uh, different policy interventions and may flag up collaborations, potential collaborations between the actors kind of in the system, rather than focusing on the individual who needs to, to do the right thing only. I'm not saying that we wouldn't focus on that partly, um, but it might widen it from that. I think it also potentially gives you ways of understanding why previous initiatives were successful or not, and how they could be either expanded and rolled out further or complemented with other measures. So that's, that's the kind of the reason for talking about them. There is also the potential, I think, to think about the unintended consequences that a behavioural intervention might have. Um, and particularly there, I think, around meaning in practices, that, that if we talk about economic rationality, you know, there's lots of messaging about turn your thermostat down and save money, but, but the environment is missing from that, from that relationship. And so although we might be successful in getting people to turn their thermostat down in order to save money, we've not necessarily built any enthusiasm in terms of values and attitudes towards the environment. So when you try to roll out the next initiative, which to you is another environmental initiative, then we may find it frustrating that people only want to do things if they save money, but you've potentially created that situation by pushing that, that message in a, in a previous initiative. Okay. Um, so what does this mean for interventions? Um, hopefully I've talked about this as we've gone through. Um, Southerton et al. Have, have kind of suggested that um, in what that they've done for the Scottish Government in looking at lots of behavioural change initiatives, that uh, it's helpful to look at the individual, the social and the material. So um, it is helpful to consider individuals and interventions that focus on influencing their attitudes, their choices, their skills perhaps. Um, but also to look at the social interventions that are targeted at changing norms and shared understandings of a problem or of a solution. Uh, and finally, material interventions that target the objects, technologies, um, and the infrastructure. And I think we often, that, that kind of intuitively makes sense, you know. You can't get people to recycle if they don't have the right bins. But actually, um, in in material in this context, they would also include like the rules and regulations and the timings of daily life, more kind of slightly softer um, institutions. Uh, so, so social norms and what is acceptable, what is the standard way of behaving uh, could potentially come into material there. And the idea that, that that comes out of that is that it's combinations of measures. So rather than having to wed yourself to one model or another, being aware of a multiplicity of them is quite helpful. 
Uh, okay, so a few concluding remarks. Um, my view is that it's useful to consider different models. I'd be keen to hear whether you think it is. Um, it frames the problem differently and potential solutions differently. It's become terribly popular, uh, particularly in academic circles, to really critique information deficit. Like people will sort of say, oh, it's just information deficit. So if you're some kind of moron for suggesting that people might need to know what to do before they could do it. Um, and I think there's a real risk that we throw the baby out with the bathwater there, but that maybe it's a necessary rather than sufficient condition. It's not enough to just give information. What are the measures that we're complementing around that to facilitate the types of behaviour we're imagining in our interventions? Um, the selection of the appropriate model, I think it's also worth saying, can be really very much a political and ideological thing. The role of business, the role of individual agency, the role of the state, these are all implicated in the model that you pick. Doing the right thing, facilitating people to do the right thing is a very popular political discourse at the moment and it very much fits in an individual psychological model. It doesn't talk about the structuring of daily life, the constraints that are upon people and the limitations they have in terms of their own agency. And so I think Whilst I'm not saying that we can, um, you know, people would have different positions on that, I suppose, but actually being aware of which position we want to take when we're talking about how to do something about this, knowing whether we're talking from the same position or a different one and why, I think is a, a helpful starting point. Um, so it helps us be explicit about what we're targeting, what is the actual problem. It helps us know whether that is shared by all the stakeholders in that particular system. Does everybody conceive of the problem as a, a matter of individual choice or a matter of the structuring and the, the sort of social control of daily life? Um, and the assumptions about behaviour and agency that that's based on. So I hope that that is useful in giving some kind of different perspectives and maybe a little bit of um, a kind of structured or stepwise approach for thinking about interventions. Thanks. That's great, thank you very much. Lots of food for thought. Okay, so we're going straight on to our next speaker now, which is uh, Amanda Pierce from uh, Diva Creative. Thanks. So yeah, I've come to talk a bit more specifically, I guess, about how you take some of those ideas and kind of place them maybe within a context which is more practical. Um, I'm a, a director of a marketing communications agency uh, called Diva, um, and just a little bit about us, just so you have a kind of bit of understanding of what we are. We're a company that was born in Sheffield, grew in Sheffield. Um, we were established actually in 1997, <coughs> um, and really all the way through our existence, we've been interested in promoting what we call social change and um, doing campaigns and communication which is all about getting people to think differently about their lifestyle and the choices that they make. Um, we're a sustainable business, so that means that we focus very heavily on having quite an ethical approach. We're not a social enterprise, but we do think very carefully about who we work for and what we do. And primarily, we deliver all sorts of campaigns to um, essentially get people to think differently about what they're doing. And we use a lot of social marketing practices to do that, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, our, in terms of our expertise, um, what we actually do is we do lots of very practical things. So we do research, we talk to people, we find out what they think. So say, for example, if we're wanting to um, get people to think about being more physically active, um, and we have maybe a specific goal that we want them to increase their levels of physical activity in terms of how much they do in a week. Um, we'll actually talk to people um, who represent the audience that we're trying to change. Uh, so probably people who aren't being very physically active and actually talk to them about why they, why they, you know, they all know that they should be, but why aren't they? And what kind of things would help them engage with the idea of doing more? Um, and we do then develop lots of what we call interventions, projects, lots of things that help to engage. So we might do websites and apps and go out on the streets and talk to people, um, videos and all sorts of things like that to try and communicate those kind of messages. Now, a lot of what we do, uh, we call social marketing. And broadly, that fits quite well, I think, with what you were talking about. 
Um, we, th we think in marketing communications terms, but we think about behavior and we think about motivations. Um, and just to kind of touch on the idea about information, um, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think people do think that information deficit is a kind of, you can't just tell people what to do and they'll do it, and that's absolutely correct. But a lot of the time, you know, some of the time, people actually don't know. Um, and sometimes it does help. There's a great example of um, uh, quite some time ago now when um, there was some very specific scientific evidence that showed that uh, if you have a baby and if you put it on its back, it's less likely to die from um, cot death syndrome. And that was a piece of information that was communicated through the government, through the Department for Health. And guess what? Everybody thought, right, OK, I don't want my baby to die. I'm going to put it on its back. So there's some very clear examples of, you know, it's actually quite useful to know what to do. The problem is that once you do that and people don't do it, so you tell them that they might die if they smoke, but they still smoke, then you have to think more carefully about how you do that. So when we think about marketing, communication, the way that we think about it is we think about what are we trying to get them to do. So we're usually trying to think about, and it works within an environmental context, it works within a health context, all sorts of different ways. Um, but it might be that we actually want people to think about having a flu vaccination because um, that's a good thing to do and it will reduce the likelihood of them getting flu and reduce the cost of health, uh, NHS, and also um, help them feel better or stop um, stop them from doing something like starting smoking. So we might do some work with young people about why it's not a great idea to start smoking. Um, or we might think, well, actually, what we want them to do is actually shift a behavior from what they're currently doing. And we've done a lot of work around this, which is travel and transport um, within uh, sustainability. So you know, we might think, well, wouldn't it be great if more people cycled to work instead of driving? Much better for the environment, but also quite good for their physical activity levels too. Um, or we might actually want them to stop doing something altogether because it's just not a great idea. And there's lots of examples of social marketing campaigns and interventions. And it goes right back as a discipline to the 1970s in the USA where they, the, the idea was developed. And I'll just very quickly mention uh, how it works. So commercial marketing versus social marketing, really briefly. You may find this kind of obvious, but it, it, if you're a commercial marketer, so if you're selling a product, you're trying to sell someone a car or a bag of sweets or whatever, um, obviously it's all about building profit. It's all about selling a product to get more money than you paid to make it uh, and to make money. Um, it's all about shareholders. It's measured by profit um, and it's driven by demand. And it's very much about a commercial imperative. With the social marketing, what we're actually looking at is social good. So we're applying some of those principles that you apply to commercial marketing into a social context. So often uh, these things are funded by government uh, or through government or uh, different kind of corporate, uh, kind of national institutions rather than from commercial uh, funds or profits. And they're measured instead of by profit in behavioral goal. So actually, how many people have we got to stop smoking compared to how many were when we started? And in terms of what the products are, they're actually um, much more focused on the kind of behavioral goals that we're trying to achieve. And they're trying to nudge or trigger people into change. So that's just a very brief uh, comparison between commercial and social marketing. One of the main things that a lot of traditional communications campaigns within the world that wants to make people do things differently. So, you know, not so long ago, um, people were being told about having five a day and, uh, you know, fruit and veg. And um, it's very easy to, you know, do the information deficit thing and say, well, you know, you really ought to be eating five fruit and veg a day because they've made you healthier. And people go, oh, right, okay, then I'll do it. Um, and so, that's often been the way, the practice that, that, that's been applied. Um, but what we do is actually do the bottom of that, which is try and understand why people, once you tell them what they should do, actually choose not to do it. So um, by doing that, and then we start to understand why people don't do things and what might motivate them to do it, and then that gives us some insight that we can then think, okay, 
So now we know why people might not be doing these things. Let's think about what we can do to support that change. So again, it's very much about avoiding didactic approaches and relying on the fact that you just tell somebody to do something because they won't necessarily do it. Um, there are lots of behavioral theories that can be applied to uh, this discipline. Um, and I won't kind of go through all, all of those. But basically, a lot of them come down to looking at motivation um, and look at why people do things. And some of them are quite stealthy. Um, this one that was relatively recently developed called Nudge, uh, which people might have heard of, which is this idea that you kind of suggest something. So you put a picture of a piece of cake with a bite out of it, and it makes someone want cake. Because what you've done is suggest that somebody else is eating cake, rather than just putting a piece of cake. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of different things. There's things like protection, motivation, which is actually all about, well, actually, quite a lot of the time, people are motivated by other people. So they might be motivated to do something out of the desire to protect another. So that might be a really good way. And sometimes, when we've done campaigns, the campaign a while ago about skin cancer for men, and what we recognized was that actually it's probably their wives that we need to talk to rather than the men directly. So the, we found out that that was a much more powerful way of actually getting men to take some action because in, in that particular situation, that group who were slightly older, that seemed to be a more positive route. So, so we were looking at the protection motivation model. I won't go on too much more about that because I could go on all night. <laughs> um, so one of the main... One of the, one of the ones that people use a lot is called the stages of change model, which is um, developed by uh, two people called Prochaska and Di Clemente, and it's a very well-known one, and it's very easy to understand. Basically, uh, you probably can't read this, so I'm sorry about that, but I'll tell you what it says. It essentially works on an idea that you need to take people through a process. So some people will be... Um, say, for example, if you're thinking about kind of trying to get people to take the bus more often, some people will be resilient to that to, the, to the, a great degree. So they'll be thinking, no, absolutely not on, on this planet am I ever going to take the bus. I love my car, and that's how I'm going to be. And then at the other end of that spectrum, you've got people who are taking the bus and, in fact, really like taking the bus and try and get other people to take the bus. So you've got your two ends of a spectrum. Um, and you've also got people who are in between those two ends. Some people who are possibly thinking that they might sometimes, and other people who are sort of very close to doing it. They might even do it occasionally, but you know, they, could be, they could be encouraged to do more. And if you start to map people and think about where they are in terms of a behavior, you can start to think about how you can move them along. And the idea is that people actually aren't fixed. None of us are fixed. None of us make decisions and stick to them for our lives. We, we do things now differently to how we did them a couple of years ago, never mind 10 years ago. So an idea that we might have had a while ago, like, I love smoking, I'm never going to stop, you might change when you get a bit older. So the idea is that people will change, and people need motivation to change. But if you know whereabouts they are on the spectrum, then you can encourage change. And if people are more in the contemplation stage, you're obviously going to affect change more quickly. So, for example, um, if you're wanting to improve air quality by um, getting people to reduce driving, if people are more aware of that and they're more conscious about it, they're more likely to do it than somebody who really doesn't care very much. We've developed this model in terms of sustainable travel. Um, where we've kind of started off by trying to influence behavior. Um, and it's a model that we've actually developed ourselves, which is all about trying to get people from being aware. So some people at the end of the spectrum are totally unaware of what the options are. So they think the only way I can get to work in the morning is by car, that's it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got people who are going, I really like the fact that I can cycle to work now, and I'm going to get everybody that I know to do that. And then in between that, you maybe have got people who are saying, well, I might do it, but I'm not quite sure how, or I'm not quite sure where the cycle routes are, or I'm not quite sure where to get a bike. And what we try and do is work out where people are and then design an intervention that fits with that. That's a very brief... <laughs> sorry about all the models and the fact that you can't read all of them, but that's a very brief... Uh, summary of how we approach 
doing a piece of work. So we'll always start off with, it's obvious getting started, but thinking very carefully about what our behavioural goals are. What do we really want to achieve? And that's so important. If you don't know that at the beginning, then you're never going to know if you've got that. Then the next thing that we do is look at how do we scope that? How do we find out what's going on? Then we start to develop something. We quite often test it out. Are we right? Are we using public funds responsibly? And then we might develop it and implement it. And then we have to test out, did it work? And then we have to think, well, how would we do it differently afterwards? So it's quite a straightforward model, and it's a very well-practiced model, particularly in health. I'm going to go, go through just a couple of examples in real time, and these are real examples of what we work we've done. Um, a couple of years ago, we were asked to do some work around healthcare-acquired infections, which are those um, nasty things that you pick up in hospitals quite often, um, MRSA and uh, C. diff and things like that. And we were asked to go into some hospitals in Leeds to find out how we could improve take up of the actions that people need to do to reduce getting an infection. Um, and because there was a lot of concern about the levels of infection and the fact that a lot of the time it's about people's practice. So it's about staff and how they follow procedures. And it's also about the general public. So when people go in to visit someone in hospital, are they doing the right things to protect both themselves and, of course, the vulnerable patient? Um, so we did a very comprehensive study. We did a lot of research. We talked to doctors, nurses, support staff, right the way through, and we talked to the general public. Um, you know, everybody knew about it. They all knew that what they should do, and they all knew about where the little bottles of squeezy stuff was and all the rest of it. Um, and we uncovered quite a lot of interesting things about hospital culture and about people's ability to challenge and whether... Some staff felt comfortable with challenging a consultant walking in with his tie on and things like that. Um, and we talked to the public as well about how they've perceived the risk. And they were telling us things like, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, I don't think it really makes any difference whether I got a cold and I go and visit someone. Um, and having done that uh, intervention, we developed an intervention which, which we used the information that we found out to develop a campaign called Prevent Infection, Protect Everyone. And what we found was that people needed to feel emotionally engaged. They needed to feel that it actually mattered and it was important, particularly the general public. They really needed to understand that. And we used some quite emotive messaging. We had a video, which I can't show because it didn't work, which is kind of this picture of somebody whose baby died because they went into hospital when they with, a, with a, an infection than they shouldn't have done. Really hard-hitting stuff, um, but, it, but it was very powerful. Um, and what we did was we did, for the public, quite a, a high-profile uh, visual campaign, and then for the staff, we did a whole lot of work around recognition and positive affirmation. So there's a big culture in hospitals, quite relevant today, around punishing people for doing wrong, uh, not much about rec recognising good practice when it happens. So we did a whole reward scheme about good practice, and we did some training videos and all sorts of things like that. Um, and we did a campaign where we, we basically made sure that people actually recognised yeah, their, um, their own sort of failings and what, that they could be vulnerable. And then we did things like um, put massive great red stickers everywhere, uh, which was, again, that just didn't happen before. There was just this little box on the wall and the people were expected to see it. So we, a bit like they do with intensive care, really. Um, we did get some very good results. We got a 38% reduction in CDI cases within the first two months. Um, we got um, high other rewards in the hospital wanting to invest money in putting up all the signage and to doing all the rest of it. Um, and we won a number of awards ourselves because there was a lot of recognition of the amount of work that had gone in and the understanding. I've just got one, two very small, short ones around, which are more environmentally based. What my point is that you can apply a lot of this to green campaigns as well. In Darlington, we were asked to do a campaign to get young people to just go on the bus more. There was this problem where once it's, once it's not free anymore, they stop using the bus. <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, 
but um, what we did was we talked to young people, and actually we discovered that, because there was a definite loss, downtrend in, in patronage, and what we discovered was they, they, they thought bus travel was really quite poor. They didn't really rate it as a way of getting around. They didn't really know, actually, there were quite a lot of really good value deals, and that actually it didn't cost them as much as they thought it would. Um, and they felt that it was a bit uncool. So what we did was we actually engaged with them to design a campaign, and we used lots of social media and Facebook because that's where they communicate. Um, and we did a big campaign, which they really liked, which was very targeted to the messaging that they told us would be relevant. So it was around cost, because that was the primary barrier. Um, and we communicated how to do that. And we got an 80% increase in visitors to that website. Um, and we got um, a 1.3 increase in patronage, um, which doesn't sound much, but believe me, it is when it comes to buses, um, which was the first time it had gone up for 50 years. So they were very pleased. And finally, uh, a little campaign that we did at the end of last year, which was about lapsed cyclists. So they're people who have a bike in the, in the shed that they haven't ridden for a long time. And um, we were asked by the uh, CTC, the National Camp uh, Ch Cycling Charity, um, to, um, to do a campaign. They've got all these centers uh, that they wanted people to go along to to get their bikes fixed up so they could ride them. So the idea was to promote cycling, to make people think, actually, I could cycle, but I'm just not doing it. So we came up with a, an idea. We did a lot of research, desk research, because there's a lot of information out there about why people don't cycle. You don't always have to talk to people. Sometimes you can find it out through other means. And we found that we needed to do lots of stuff around reassuring people about cycling. People feel unconfident. They don't feel very positive about it. Um, and they don't necessarily see it as something they do as a family. So their kids might do it, but they're not going to. So we came up with um, something called the Big Bike Revival, um, which was um, a very friendly-looking campaign, uh, very much a family one. Um, and it was Big Bike Revival, Love Your Bike. And um, we did a lot of promotion locally in the northwest in, um, in West Yorkshire. And we got really, really good results. We got 41% of people saying that they were going to cycle more, because we surveyed them all when they came along. Um, and um, pledges from people saying that they would do more. And the, the most important thing for us was that actually lots of people turned up who never had been to a cycling center before, who, who would never have gone there. And they were so positive about the way it had been promoted, because they didn't feel like they were being lectured to or made to feel guilty for not doing it. It was very much promoted as a family fun event. Um, so in summary, you can apply social marketing in a very pragmatic way and behavioral theory to affect how people make choices. It's not the only way you can do it, and uh, legislation is a very powerful tool as well. But it's a great complement to other ways that the change can be achieved. In my experience from doing this for about 18 years, you have to be very pragmatic and flexible about how you apply those theories. Um, but be very careful to make sure you do your scoping first. So make sure you really understand as much as you can about what drives people's behavior and what, who you're trying to get to. Um, and then also make sure you build in the evaluation. If we hadn't done some surveys when we did the Big Bat Revival, we wouldn't have known who came there. We wouldn't have known what people felt about it. We wouldn't have known that they were, they were going to uh, achieve. And in fact, that campaign led to economic benefit um, that the Department for Transport were very pleased about. For every pound spent, they recognized a three pound return on that investment. So it actually had an economic case as well, believe it or not. That's it. <laughs> Sorry. OK, so on to our third and final speaker, which is Dr. Joe Smith, who's a senior lecturer at Open University. Thanks very much. Um, I'm an open university academic. We've got uh, 150,000 students, I'm told, uh, but we never see them. 
So I'm pathetically grateful to have the opportunity to see some real human beings. So if I'm a bit over-enthusiastic, gripping the microphone and having to have it fought off me, that is the reason. Um, it's a real privilege to contribute uh, tonight. Um, I think the uh, commission is a great idea. I think the uh, grassroots uh, and networking work that the other institutions involved in this are doing are fantastic. Um, it's also a real relief to find that I agree with everything that's been said already. Um, I think that uh, Carly and Amanda's demonstration of a kind of pragmatism about bringing all that we know about communications and behavior change to just trying to crack on and take a few steps forward is exactly the kind of attitude that we all need. Um, but it wouldn't be much fun or interesting uh, if I say the same things as them again. So I'm going to try to step away from uh, the literature on uh, the psychology and the sociology of behavior change, step away from the, I think, excellent examples of social media and other media use in action around campaigning, and talk about history and talk about the future and talk about politics and implicitly talk about Eliot's retirement date of 2066, I think we calculated. So I'm sorry, Elliot, uh, you've, got, you've got a long working life ahead. Well, I hope you've got a long working life ahead of you. Um, the reason I want to talk about a date that I, I think probably to you feels an impossibly long way away um, is, uh, but you're lucky, um, is because I want to get a sense of how we need to think in terms of uh, really quite long time scales. So five years is a long time scale for some sorts of changes. Um, but 50 years is a short time for others. When I was uh, your age, Elliot, I was working for the Green Party in their press office. I say working, I wasn't paid, obviously. Um, but we were asked the question by a seasoned campaigner, myself and the other volunteer, 19-year-old Andrew Sims, now one of the best campaigners in Britain, I think. And uh, we were asked by Roland, so how long do you think it's going to, this was 1991, I think, how long is this going to take to crack? When will we live in a sustainable society? And Andrew and I cracked back the answer, well, we'd better have this done within the decade. Um, the subtext, of course, being the assumption that we were going to do a lot of the doing. Um, now, Roland tried to sort of manage our expectations down and suggest that really uh, we might see sustainable societies within our lifetime and that 50 years was a reasonable time scale to work on. And I think that, um, uh, okay, so we're not quite two decades down the road, but I think that Roland has been proven comprehensively right in the sense that this is going to take longer to crack than we might have thought, but crack it we will. And I think that's uh, the background to what I want to say. My background's in, I'm in a geography department, but I work with history and politics. Um, I spend some of my spare time working with media decision makers, both to help them uh, advise them on material that goes out into broadcast, but also more strategic level conversations about how the media should handle these complex issues. Um, and that's uh, part of what I'm basing some of what I've got to say on. So I work as a social scientist when I cover these issues, and I come to the conclusion that if we just take the, this rather clumsy term of public opinion, there's good news. I think that uh, climate change is a story that is a glass half full. And I think this is an achievement of NGOs, local government. I think it's an achievement of the media, often knocked on this topic. But without mass media attention to this topic, we would not have moved in the space of just a few years to a point where most people on the planet are aware of the notion of climate change, most of them are aware of human involvement in that, and most of them believe we should do something about it. I think that's astonishing. It is such a weird thought to imagine that the decisions you and I make about how we fill our kettle, how we travel to work, and whether we've got loft insulation or not, affecting the global atmosphere, 
is an extraordinarily difficult thought to take on board. And yet, it seems that a broad, you know, majority, somewhere between 40 and 60% of the population of the world, so this is including developing countries, in cities at least, get that this is an issue. I think that's a glass half full and definitely the place that I would want to be starting if I want to do something about it. But here we are doing something about it. Um, don't worry too much about the detail, but this Sankey diagram essentially describes energy sources over here. This is where we are now, roughly speaking, oil, biomass, gas, coal, nuclear, renewable. It describes what they go into, the conversion devices, the engines we use, and so on. It describes what they're for, cars, furnaces, appliances, and the services that they deliver. It's a messy diagram, and it wouldn't necessarily fill you with the kind of optimism I was trying to build up in the last slide, uh, because it does suggest there's an awful lot of work to do. Well, that's for sure. But I guess I just want to keep in view that this is a snapshot in time, and that our energy systems and humanity's lives with energy have constantly been in change and much more radical changes than we often recognize. And Sheffield, of course, has a particular, uh, you know, particular history with that in terms of its uh, presence, its prominence in the history of industrialization. And we should be a bit forgiving of ourselves about the fact that this is just difficult. We've not been here before. The nature of climate change is an issue as we try to connect it to our politics, our public conversations, our private conversations, um, is demanding because it has a character that we've simply not met before in a major challenge. I'm not going to go through all these, but the fact that it's global, the fact that the uncertainties are constantly uh, present in the issue, um, with regard to that, I mean, I, I'm pretty allergic to any use of the word fact or truth or belief in relation to climate change. I think it makes much more sense to talk about us constantly working to narrow the boundaries of uncertainty. I'll come back to that and how we might communicate that in other ways in a minute. I want to go to the last point there, though, about vulnerability and responsibility. One of the distinctive features of climate change is that the responsibilities for it are unevenly spread. They're unevenly sp spread around the planet. They're unevenly spread across time. And that makes the politics tricky. And so we should expect the annual negotiations, this year's are particularly important in Paris in December, we, November, December, we should expect them to be difficult because the developing world walks in the room with an awareness that we've been having a 250-year carbon party, um, uh, particularly in this part of the world, and that we hold some responsibility for that. And at the same time, uh, the, um, uh, you know, Young people of today, I think, have a reasonable sense that actually we would quite like to get on a jet plane too. Um, so we should expect this politics to be difficult. One way I think we should respond to this is not by trying to consistently insist on the beautiful truth, the finished nature of our knowledge about climate change and attempt to uh, bludgeon through any difficult conversation about the topic with the fact that we hold a great big scary fact, but rather view the climate science that's being done as a risk assessment. And then just sort of actually leave them in the back room. Actually not really bother them for a while. Pop in every few years and see how they're getting on. But, um, and also, by the way, that allows climate science to be just as saucy as every other bit of science uh, that deals with major difficult topics or um, you know, saucy big bits of kit. So uh, the physics at CERN, they have uh, you know, 
glamorous media representations of their work uh, at every uh, opening of a new uh, toilet cubicle, whereas the climate change scientists are uh, unending, unendingly viewed as a source of suspicion. So let them just carry on with the risk assessment, because that's all it is. And actually, the contours of that risk assessment have not changed since 1991. Okay? We had enough evidence that we should respond to that risk assessment in 1991, 92, 91. So then climate policy should be allowed to be a risk management process. Um, I need some help from my earlier colleagues, Carly and Amanda, with this phrase, risk assessment. It's so bloodless and technocratic and dull. But the truth is, um, this is where all the action is. We need to shore up, and I think this is a nice example, actually, the Sheffield Commission and, and the other work being uh, done in the city. We should invest in a transparent, careful building of a consensus around social purposes in response to the risk assessment. What would it be based on? Well, I've put up, actually, I think just a different version of what Carly was saying earlier here about what I would put, you know, if I only had a postcard to write describing what I think we should base our risk management of climate change on, I would, the headlines would be love and money. When I say love, I mean that to suggest that we're extending the boundaries of what we think matters in politics and what we think matters in our ethics. And we're caring in new ways about new things. It's really unusual for us to be thinking about future generations in political decisions today, yet that's what the UK Climate Change Act actually does. So it's an innovation, just like you know, Magna Carta and the Reform Act are innovations. Women's suffrage is an innovation. And I think this is an appropriate way to think about climate change. We are... Uh, trying to express our love for others that aren't with us now, uh, express our commitment to them. But that's not going to necessarily uh, change the uh, minutes in a FTSE 100 company meeting. So let's talk about money for a moment. Now, money is an abstraction. It's a way of counting what we care about. And we change our definition about what we care about and what we represent with money all the time. We always have. Um, we revise our definitions of success. And it's also a useful route to um, working out how we will organize collective insurance, how we will collectively prepare ourselves uh, to cope with unpredictable futures um, and uh, collectively uh, invest uh, to make the world a better place, make profit, uh, allow ourselves to expand our operations. So, yeah, love and, love and money. And in this sense, I think this suggests, actually, that environmentalism uh, needs to move on from a particular kind of habit, a rather private habit of celebrating, for example, Earth Days, that once a year we'll gather together those of us that are appropriately dressed and of the right frame of mind to have our private get-togethers about environmentalism. And I want to suggest that actually we should be investing all of our time, if we take the risk assessment seriously, we should invest all of our time in trying to embed those two thoughts, the love and the money thoughts, in different quantities. Of course, if you're going to a church group meeting, you might be emphasizing one of those. If you're going to a boardroom meeting, you might be emphasizing the other. But really embedding them in the everyday. So uh, I'm like Carly, I'm a social scientist, and I wanted to try, I won't really dwell on this because I think you did a great job of this, but I just wanted to boil down what I think we've learned across 20 years in environmental social science about how you might support action at a number of scales, but particularly 
deal with some of the resistance that people might feel to this complex set of issues. And I think these four things are all, I said I wouldn't use the word truth, didn't I? Pretty well okay. Agency, people need to feel that whatever you do, whatever a Sheffield Green Commission might propose, are supporting them in a feeling that we can meet the challenges we are presented with. In a longer version, I would put, we can probably meet, uh, because of course, acts of God, who knows where we'll be, but people need to feel a sense of agency. Related to that, they need to see that there's a sense of choice, that they aren't being driven to a particular set of actions, but rather that they have made a choice. And that's been an important editorial tweak in some of the work I've done with broadcasters. Um, and I think successfully so. I think the third is that um, they don't want to really want to hear the th about the threats to the place they are. They want to hear a story that is about making that place better. And either that it'll improve their places or help them cope with uh, challenges and changes. Um, and in that respect, I mean, I called my talk, uh, I'm trying to remember what I called my talk now, um, uh, less climate and more action, sorry, less climate and more change, a uh, suggestion that actually we shouldn't really be talking a great deal about climate change when we try to engage people in mitigating climate change, in reducing fossil fuel use. Um, and uh, at the same time, we do need to be delivering some sense of action, some sense of change, positive change. You could say, you know, change is coming, what sort of change do you want, is a really uh, apt way of kicking off from that. And fourthly, um, I don't believe that uh, good lives have to cost the earth. Um, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, so uh, this isn't, for, I, don't, I hope this doesn't go on the front page of the Sheffield Evening News, if there's such a thing, uh, but I think sustainability and quality of life should start with a conversation about quality of death. Now, why do I say that? Well, there are, I think, no people on the planet on their deathbed who want to talk about the fact that they should have upgraded their Mercedes more often. It just doesn't happen. There's no evidence from any society that people sense that they didn't consume enough. However, there's lots of evidence that they have regrets about perhaps spending too long at the office, uh, perhaps uh, not retiring earlier, perhaps, uh, perhaps not doing some of the things that might have got them there uh, early. Um, and I think that concentrating on what a good life is, what people really care about, is a really important reference point. And I, I know from some of the campaigns you've done that aversions of that are important in some of your successes. We won't spend long on awkward truths, but I just want to log the fact that I don't think that um, eco-efficiency and loads of communications from us are going to deliver the scale of CO2 emissions reductions that will requ be required to uh, deliver a likely to be livable uh, atmosphere. We live in a temperate buffer, of course, uh, here uh, on our corner of uh, uh, the Europe, uh, in our corner of Europe, and um, uh, you know we have a relatively luxurious uh, situation in that respect. But um, there's just not going to be enough. We do have to do some difficult political work and strengthen and widen coalitions. And uh, uh, I think imagination about the kind of language we might need to use to invite more people into this conversation is terribly important. We also need to think ahead into some uh, unattractive and even dangerous consequences of successes. So I think I'm going to see in my lifetime uh, green energy that's too cheap to meter. It was a phrase, of course, associated with nuclear power in the last century. In this century, I think I will see renewables or some other technological developments that will see energy very, very cheap and widely available again. And I think that one consequence of that is the entire and complete and wholesale suburbanization of the planet.
So I just think you need to think into what the consequences might be of our success. That's why sustainability thinking, it's a dreadful term. Anyone that can improve on that, please do. But thinking in terms of uh, integrated wholes is terribly important. I just wanted to add a note about Sheffield Commission as I finish. Um, I, I've been looking back through the uh, meeting notes and contributions you've had to date, and I just wanted to distinguish between uh, kind of apples of mobility, energy, economy, infrastructure, quite technocratic things, things you can measure, things that are suited to quite a systems approach, which has been one of the contributions I know you've had already. And then there are pairs that are softer somehow. Quality of life, well-being, engagement, change. Uh, you wouldn't measure these two in the same way, I think. And um, I'm very convinced by the power of stories shared between people, stories shared at an international level through fantastic storytellers, whether it's David Attenborough, Philip Pullman, and so on. Uh, but also stories shared in a household, stories shared in a street. And I think that stories about quality of life and well-being are potentially very powerful. Stories about profitability, of course, travel very quickly, particularly when uh, you whack in a carbon tax. I think carbon taxes are going to become a mainstream response uh, to climate change across the next 10 years. So there are all sorts of stories to be told. But just what you measure, I wanted to offer one possibility. Uh, these are the photo credits, by the way. Uh, all the lovely photos I've used aren't mine. They're borrowed from people. Um, just to offer one thought about how you me might measure things on the commission. I want to offer one really sensitive measure of success for Sheffield in its achievement of sustainability. In 1970, I think it is, uh, a busload of Swedish planners were taken around Nottingham to see the bleeding, cutting edge of integrated transport policies to deliver environmentally sustainable transport in Nottingham. So I want one of your measuring, measurements for success to be the arrival in 2025 of a busload of Swedish planners to see you pick the indicator, transport, energy, don't care which. But that would be a really sensitive measure of the success of all of the people in this room. Thank you for your attention. OK, uh, thank you very much to our three speakers for their fascinating talks. Thank you. So what I'd like to do now is uh, I'm hoping our Green Commissioners are writing away and scribbling and thinking of some fantastic questions to ask our speakers. So can I begin by seeing if anyone has some questions to ask? Beatrice. Jo, um, I was just wondering, can we rely on politicians to do the right thing in terms of climate change? Um, well, let's start, let's start with the optimistic bit of this answer, which is that I think that the 2008 Climate Change Act is a really remarkable document that doesn't achieve in, uh, you know, receive enough attention. It's the first time on the planet that uh, the future and the biogeophysical world has been represented in law in this kind of way. And that, that's an achievement of consensus. You know, that's across the house. And that's a, an amazing thing to build from. And I think it's worth working out how you push that forward to the next stage. Um, and the opportunities, I don't think, lie now in pushing forward climate change. I think they lie in pushing forward um, uh, other responses to our tax and spend challenges. I find it amazing that carbon taxation uh, uh, has not been seriously explored. A revenue neutral, so you would, for example, reduce income tax and reduce uh, corporation tax by a proportionate amount nationally um, and allow uh, carbon tax to be ramped up over time. You might fully protect certain industries. So the steel industry, for example, is very efficient in Sheffield, globally 
by global comparisons, um, it's not got any more efficiency to gain. So you might say, actually, do you know what? We're not going to have the fight with the chemistry and chemical and steel industries. We're going to protect them for, is it going to be 10 years, 15 years, um, while they work out, for example, how they'll become steel leasing industries rather than steel producing industries. But you need to give them enough time. So um, on the upside, amazing political achievements already. On the downside, I, they've got a great big opportunity in my mind, sitting right in front of them with carbon taxation. I don't understand why they don't do it, other than because the Daily Mail won't leave them the room to talk about it. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything. Okay. Just, a, just a general question, really, for the three uh, presenters tonight. Do you feel people are punch drunk by the approach about the climate change and the issues, and do you think it should be a more nudge, sort of subtle approach to people's behavioural change? Um, I, think, I think message weariness is inevitable, really, with these kind of things. I mean, you see it in, in all sorts of areas where people are constantly told, oh, you know, now you need to do this, now you need to do that. So I think that is always going to be a challenge. Um, and I think every now and again, actually, what you have to do is remind people of the bigger picture too. And I think that's some, I suppose some of what you were kind of doing was sort of actually looking at it from a global perspective. And it's that whole kind of macro, micro thing that I think people can engage with and understand. Um, but I also think that you can find out how people feel and where their kind of receptiveness is and what it is that they really need to understand. I think a lot of the time people just, they, you know, they don't really adopt a behaviour because they don't really understand why it makes a difference. You know, they, they're given these messages, um, but they don't really see the impact. So they don't really understand what difference will it really make if I don't drive to work tomorrow. Will it really make any difference? Not really. So I might as well just do it. And it, you know, and it ends there. So I think, I, I think if you just keep lecturing and you know, didactically telling people what to do, then yes, they'll, they'll quickly turn off. But if you start to actually educate and communicate in a different way or try different techniques and different ways of doing it than they will. And, you know, also a lot of uh, effective, if you look at uh, some commercial um, organisations who have been around for a very long time um, and how they've developed and evolved, they might still be Coca-Cola selling Coke, but they're doing it in a way that we still want to buy it. Uh, why is that? You know, and we need to think about some of those very good techniques and practices and think, well, why don't we use them, some of that in order to sell this message and keep it fresh and true? So there's lots of things you can do, I think. I think weariness is, is inevitable. But... Uh, yeah, OK, so I, I think it's a really good, it's a really good question. Uh, and one of the most depressing things that I've heard recently uh, from new undergraduates at the university is that they're bored of climate change. Uh, They've heard about it for a long time. Nothing seems to be changing, and they don't want to hear about it anymore. Um, and so I think, you know, partly that's about maybe um, that there have been successes in bringing it into the curriculum and things like that. And so, so actually, by the time they get to university, uh, maybe we need to be tailoring messages in different ways about, about solutions. So I think, you know, what both of the other speakers have talked about, the importance of solutions. But I think you guys have a kind of difficult um, balancing act there because there is, a, there is this risk between it being hopeless. Okay, so uh, the Tyndall Centre has done a lot of work around the two degree target and whether it's achievable or not and whether the, the UK's Climate Change Act, which is a really exciting bit of legislation that really puts us at the leading edge of the world in terms of legislation about climate change, but is it actually commensurate with a two degree target? Um, and the work that we've done at the Tyndall Centre would say no. And therefore, that makes people feel a bit hopeless, I think. And there's a lot of talk about moving away from a two degree global target, so limiting average warming to, to two degrees, rather than we've been talking about perhaps we need to engage more with thinking about what four degrees looks like. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is that if you only talk about two degrees um, whilst actually not instigating policy that is in line with that globally, your risk assessment for adaptation to climate change is inappropriate. And so particularly if you get step changes in other parts of the world where we've been talking a lot about it's going to be two degrees. And actually, remember, that's an average, so not the extremes that people are dealing with around the world. So, so I worry a bit about that being hopeless. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I want us to be more optimistic, but I don't want us to move away completely from the fact that this is a scientifically understood problem that isn't only about doing things that make us feel good. It is meant to link back, if, if we're really talking about climate change as a motivator, to some level of, um, okay, with uncertainty, but some level of, of knowledge about what, what kind of climate we might have in the future. And so things like getting really preoccupied with plastic bags feels to me um, perhaps not a significant enough change. And if we think about the kind of practices stuff that I talked about, about the structuring of daily life and, and what it is that's important, what do people regret on their deathbed? But what are we socialised to aspire to during our life? That's, you know, that's, that's a more sort of fundamental problem. So I think um, in a commission like this, getting that balance between realistic targets that really do talk to significant change, but making it hopeful and solutions focused, but keeping a, a continuity there is, is, is a challenge uh, that, that you guys have to deal with rather than me, so that's nice. <laughs> Just tuck in a quick one on that, um, and that question of what people are really turned on by, and, and consumption's role in that. I think, um, I mean, I think we should talk about climate change less around particularly mitigation. And uh, what would that mean, say, in terms of the daily commute? Well, it might mean pointing out to people who have a car that can drive at 160 miles an hour, um, but that are arriving at work later than they would if they'd cycled, that actually there's some, you know, some perversity in that. We should have racetracks, you know, where you go and go and exercise that. You lease the car, you get the most amazing one. You know, so just trying to turn some of those assumptions about what good quality means. Um, and, you know, also can accept the fact that we, you, your question was about, well, are people bored? But also there was the, the question about politics. Actually, um, you know, for example, people from the right of the political spectrum are really offended by waste. Wasted taxes. They're offended by um, uh, by uh, subsidy, and so pointing actually to the fact that fossil fuels have been subsidised for a very long time um, is an important part of that story. Um, and that's a motivator. You know, Nigel Farage knows that's a motivator. So you know, we could borrow one or two of his tricks. I think. Um, I was just wondering how you guys would go about, um, if it was down to you, um, promoting a more positive image where, in most cases, uh, the problems we have to deal with is about keeping it at the status quo and preventing things to go badly, rather than we're not necessarily achieving a better world in the moment. We're just trying to stop it falling off the cliff as such. So how would you go about trying to uh, portray that positive image when a lot of it is just stopping something bad from happening. Well, I mean, I don't, yeah, again, I wouldn't want to be quoted on, the, uh, quoted on this directly, but, um, I mean, one, one gag I'd offer would be that actually climate change is the best thing that's ever happened to us in years. It um, provokes us to think differently about uh, our, our economy and politics and society and how they fit together and provokes us to ask some demanding questions. And I would want to start every conversation with, uh, you know, climate change is an opportunity to uh, make our lives better, make our businesses run better, make our daily lives feel better. Um, I'm not lifting the trap door on uh, adapting to a uh, four-degree world because um, I think that's a, that's a really difficult conversation that we might want to move into, but... Um, I, I, I'm undecided as to whether we should go near that. But I think ad action on mitigation and to some degree adaptation, um, almost all the things you would need to do if you're a household or a business are things that will make things better. Yeah, I think for me what you're talking about is how do we stand still? Is, is that what you're really saying? How do we stop things getting worse? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's a, compl a, a difficult idea, isn't it? Because most of the time people need to feel motivated to improve something or to make something change for the better. So to kind of try and do something based on let's, let's not get it any worse is, is, a, is a kind of negative premise. 
um, which from a communications perspective is quite a hard thing to maintain. Um, and I would be much more focused around, and also I think it's hard to measure. How do we know we're standing still? How do we know it's not getting worse or it's getting better or, or it's worse here and better there? Um, so I think my focus would always be around recognizing where people are getting it right. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of communication, um, it, as well as people feeling powerless about what impact they can have, I think people feel quite negative, they feel judged, they feel um, that the people who are doing it right are looking at them as if yeah. they should be. It's, 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 a, it's a judgmental, pejorative kind of world. And I think that I would always look to encourage and recognize and acknowledge positive behavior and, um, and enable people to adopt that rather than to sort of focus on how well we're doing. I think once you start getting into the world of measurement and, and where are we and how do we stop it getting any worse, I think that's a hard thing to do. So I would actually avoid that by focusing more on, on the kind of positive messaging. And at the end of the day, we have to get better. We can't be satisfied with just not getting worse. So I think we have to, we have to look at something more positive. But I think tangible things are so much, and I think there is, there is this real tension between, yeah, do you focus on a specific thing like plastic bags or the bigger picture? Because at, at the end of the day, what difference will it make with, if people just address one thing? But I think people find it very hard to look at big picture things and think, I'm a little person, what am I going to do in that? And you've got to give people something tangible, realistic and specific that makes their lives better or their children's lives better because that's another thing that's very important to people. Um, otherwise, you're talking in nebulous, broad terms that people just don't understand. And that's where I would always focus. Yeah, I mean, just echoing what's um, been mentioned a couple of times about um, quality of life uh, and well-being, I think maybe rethinking what you're measuring when you talk about things getting better or not getting worse. Um, there seemed to be a bit of a shift a few years ago that, that um, there was enthusiasm from politicians to talk about the happiness index and how, how happy were we. And all the research indicates that you kind of pass a point of wealth and you start to become unhappier. Um, so people that are much poorer around the world are much happier and more satisfied. And so trying to maybe uh, shift what it is that we're, we're measuring away from the kind of consumption of goods uh, to, to how satisfied we are with our lives. Yeah, can I just ask, um, there's everything we've talked about tonight, or what you've mentioned tonight, is that uh, there's always been an economic aspect to this. Um, do you believe that the, there has to be a, an economic uh, benefit to the individuals to actually move forward with um, their approach to green issues and, and the climate change and changing the way that they approach um, and their impact upon the environment? Um, so a kind of quick response, I think, would be that um, it's important to, to segment your market. So I think for lots of people, absolutely not. Um, people do things that are much more costly because they are environmentally friendly. There's lots of pockets of people that do those things. Um, people also do things um, that are sort of you know, perverse in an economic sense. Uh, you, know, you don't always choose the sort of lowest, lowest cost option. Um, but I think we probably need a, a kind of segmenting approach. And also there's a sort of tendency to talk much less about regulation, um, a word that's not kind of very politically appealing, um, actually trying to mandate certain behaviours. Maybe that needs, or, or not allow certain behaviours. Um, that maybe, maybe we should talk about that as well as kind of the economics, which is a bit more about kind of shifting, uh, again, choices and decision making and looking at the wider role than, than just economics. But I think it's a big barrier to trying to engage, you know, the people who would never come to an event like this. If you don't talk about economics, it's often difficult to, to engage them. So at least being aware of the implications of what you're suggesting uh, in economic terms, I think is important to have that kind of uh, kudos in speaking to a wider public and, and wider business audience. Yeah, totally. I, th I think Cost and money is, is a really an interesting one because I, you know, you, you, if you asked anybody directly, do this and you'll save money, do that and you'll waste money, they'll always say they'll do the one that saves money. But we all know that we, we all make decisions every day that, that contradict that 
totally, because we are not as rational as we think we are. Um, I do think cost matters, but it doesn't always. And I think cost and price isn't always about money. Um, a lot of people talk about convenience and time. And um, if, something, if they feel like something's more convenient or it saves them more time, then that is more beneficial than saving them actual money. So cost isn't, and price isn't necessarily an economic idea. Um, I know that politically, um, economic benefit is seen as a, as a huge indicator. And, and you know, the last few years, the government's been putting a lot of money into the local sustainable travel uh, transport fund, which is one of the main uh, indicators of or measures of that is economic benefit. So, you know, the, there is a very clear idea that we have to encourage sustainable transport, but it actually has to have an economic benefit. And politically, that's incredibly important, obviously, because of the environment in which we're currently in. Um, so I think, and I think it's quite good, and it's a good discipline to actually say, yeah, you know, is this a cost, cost benefit to whatever we're doing? Well, I think when it comes down to individual choice and motivation, it, 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 price is a difficult idea because people don't, they'll tell you they'll choose the most economical thing, but they won't necessarily do it. I do, however, think that there is a kind of whole uh, issue around green uh, politics and, and, and where and people's engagement with this debate, which is about their personal well-being and their lifestyle. And I think there's a lot more people who are more middle class and more um, wealthy who are able to think about issues like um, in the climate and the environment and everything like that, because they're not worrying about you know, how much, how they're going to feed their kids and, and all that kind of thing. And I think that's an issue that maybe the Green Commission needs to look at in terms of, you know, if we look around the room tonight, how many people are actually from a, a demographic which is usually poorly de represented in this kind of environment, who maybe for, for them, yes, price would be a massive <coughs> indicator and, and, and really mean, be more meaningful than, um, than it would be maybe to other people. So I think it's a complex area. That, Can I just add something. Um, I'm completely convinced by the, um, the economic or the, the join between the economic and policy literature which points to the importance of carbon price being much more significant. Um, it's the most efficient way for us to move forward on a whole range of concerns um, and there's difficult politics on the route to that but in the context of it being difficult to raise taxes in other ways, you would have thought they'd be looking seriously at it. Liberal government in Canada, if it gets in next time, will be looking very carefully at it. They've been working with a carbon tax in British Columbia, um, and that's looking like it's working well. Um, so if I give one concrete example in the present of success in this, in this respect that combines price signals, lifestyle changes, and political leadership, difficult political leadership, I would point to the congestion zone in London. Um, it had all sorts of obstacles thrown in its way, but it was pushed through, through political leadership, and in the wake of its success, of course, political consensus. Um, uh, in parallel, you've got a whole set of options being given to people. Last year, I, I stood with my bicycle in my first bicycle jam. And I thought, actually, this is, a, this is a success indicator. So, you know, actually, there we are. I've got another measurement indicator for you. Sheffield's, Sheffield's first bicycle jam would let, please let me know. Um, so now I want to give a silly example of what that might mean at a global level. Now, uh, we must tax kerosene. Uh, there isn't a replacement fuel for flying. Uh, flying, although people say, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. It's so politically unattractive to talk about taxing um, our air travel. Air travel is so delicious, don't go near it. Um, however, we must do this because it's one of the fastest growing areas of CO2 emissions. So here's a, another wild suggestion. When you introduce really, when I say significant taxes, carbon taxes on kerosene, all we will be doing is paying our best guess at the real social and environmental and business costs of using that fuel. That's all we'll be doing. We'll be trying to make sure the figures are right, and then we will be paying an appropriate bill. So that's politically difficult, but let's do it because it's the right thing to do with the available evidence we've got, the best economics. However, 
politically, you might sweeten the pill. And I would suggest we do it in this way, by offering travel credits to every 18-year-old and every 65-year-old on the planet. You can spend them how you like, but when you get to those key moments in life, you can have a holiday. And you could spend it in one massive kerosene burn and uh, go to Australia, it will be wonderful. Um, you might spend it on a lot of bus travel. Uh, you might spend it on a really spiffy carbon fiber bike. But the point is, um, I think uh, there's a kind of imagination required as we start to do the difficult things that really purposefully demonstrate that the place we're going is better than the place we are now um, as we respond to climate change. Okay. I'm sorry, I sort of cut you off there because we probably need to leave it there because I'm conscious that there's a, a workshop to follow as well. So um, thank you for the questions from the Green Commissioners and thank you to our um, speakers. Can I just ask you to give them a, another round of applause? For you? So I'm looking forward to a bike jam made up of Swedish people, which <laughs> will really succeeded. Um, thank you to, uh, to all of you who've attended here tonight, um, and I hope you will stay on for the workshop. The notes of the meeting uh, will be available, and please go to the City Council website and the Green Commission pages to find out more about the next hearings and the notes from, from this evening. And don't forget that we are calling for evidence, and I understand that hopefully the, the notes and information from the workshop tonight will go forward as part of the call for evidence. Um, so, so please uh, um, bring that forward and any other um, information that you have that you want to um, submit.